so this morning we did a, a quick bit on harmonic functions, the heat equation. We thought of we, there it was all sort of tied to the energy. And we, uh, let's go forward here, right? And so we thought of the uh, harmonic functions were critical points for the energy. They turned out to be minimizers. Then we looked at also the associated gradient flow where you, or method of uh, steepest descent. Is everybody keeping up? <laughs> okay. Uh, right. And so then we uh, looked at, at curves, and, and there again we looked at the energy. The, the critical points for that were geodesics. Now, that, of course, you don't have to have just minimum, uh, like the great circles on a sphere are, uh, on the, are index one uh, critical points, um, and the dynamics become more interesting. Okay, so then uh, now we're moving to mean curvature. We, uh, so now we're thinking at the, the volume functional um, on a hypersurface, in, uh, say in Euclidean space or more generally in a Ramanian manifold. And then we'd look at the, uh, we'll start by looking at the critical points of the volume functional, try to understand those. Then later we'll move on to the dynamical question where you look at the associated gradient flow, which is the mean curvature flow. So um, the critical points are, are called minimal surfaces, and those are ones where the mean curvature vanishes. And just to remind you of the normalization, this is the definition here of the, of the mean curvature, which turns out to be minus the trace of the second fundamental form, depending on how you set it up. Uh, and so uh, what are the properties of these critical points? So the main question, uh, okay, so I'll do a few things that are valid in, in arbitrary, so this is again the gradient to the flow, a few things that are valid in arbitrary dimensions, and then we'll specialize to uh, minimal surfaces in R3, they'll be two-dimensional, and we'll look at embedded ones, and then we'll talk a lot about uh, recent results there relating to classification questions and general structure questions. So first, just to remind you, here's the minimal graph equation. This is valid in, in arbitrary dimensions. So here we have a graph uh, u over a domain, in, say, in Rn. So the, this gives a hypersurface in Rn plus 1. The mean curvature of this hypersurface is given by minus the divergence of this, this funny vector field, where I take the gradient and then divide by the square root of 1 plus grad u squared. Solutions of this are called uh, minimal graphs. Or, you know, okay, and um, right, every minimal surface can be roughly written that way. So now I'd like to talk about a different way that you can tie uh, minimal surfaces in with PDE. And so this is by uh, looking at the harmonic functions restricted to a minimal surface. So this hypersurface is an n-dimensional submanifold living in Rn plus 1. We've got a unit normal, which will always be a bold n. And now if I have any function on Rn plus 1, I can restrict that to the hypersurface. This gives a function on the hypersurface. So the simplest function, well, I guess other than the constants, the simplest functions you could restrict are the coordinate functions. So if you take an ambient coordinate function and restrict that to Rn plus 1, it'll turn out that, that, actually, that those all are harmonic if and only if the surface is minimal. So here we just uh, recall a calculation that if you have a general function and restrict it, and now you look at the Laplacian, the hypersurface Laplacian, which just here to fix notation, the Laplacian is the divergence, which we've already defined, of the tangential projection of the gradient. So the gradient of f lives in r, is a vector in rn plus 1. I take the tangential part of that, I take its divergence. This is the Laplacian. So uh, the first uh, week's worth of, of a graduate Ramanian geometry course then tells you that this is given by, uh, I take the Hessian, the rn plus 1 Hessian, and I trace out just the parts tangent to sigma, and then I subtract off the, the um, gradient of f in the normal direction multiplied by the mean curvature. Okay, so now if for a coordinate function, the Hessian, the Rn plus 1 Hessian vanishes. If so, um, and so you get that you exactly pick up the mean curvature times the, the normal part of that, that derivative. So it's minimal, so the hypersurface is minimal if and only if all the coordinate functions are harmonic. Just a word of caution, this makes the mean minimal look like a linear equation because the Laplacian, of course, is a linear operator. But what's tied up in there is the Laplacian on sigma also depends on sigma in a nonlinear way. So that's where the nonlinearity comes in. So from this, for instance, you see right off uh, from the maximum principle. So suppose that you had a minimal surface with hypersurface with boundary, and suppose the boundary lay up on, above a hyperplane. Then the surface would also have to lay above the hyperplane because the distance to that hyperplane is a, one of the coordinate functions, you know, translated, and so it's harmonic. The maximum 
or say maximum principle, says it has its minimum or maximum on the boundary. Since it's above on the boundary, it has to be inside. So that's a typical application of this. Okay, so there's another function it's useful to compute, the Laplacian of. So if you look at mod x squared, so the distance function squared, in that case, the Hessian, the Rn plus 1 Hessian, is twice the identity matrix. Um, so if we compute the Laplacian, then on a minimal surface, this ends up being 2n. So this identity is the key for the, the monotonicity formula. Let me remind you what the monotonicity formula is here. So if you have a minimal hypersurface uh, with a normal, again with normal n, then you look at this density ratio. So here, you're, looking, you're intersecting the hypersurface with a, a Euclidean ball of radius r, and you're dividing by r to the n, which is what you would get if you, um, basically if you had a hyperplane in there. You look at that ratio. That ratio now gives a function of r. When you increase r, that ratio only goes up. And in fact, the derivative of that ratio is, is given by this positive quantity, non-negative quantity on the right-hand side. So the non-negative quantity, um, so the, the term to focus on is the x perp part. In order for that to be zero, then x perp has to be zero. What does it mean for x perp to be zero? It means that the position vector is actually tangent to the surface. In other words, that's an infinitesimal way of saying that if you scale the surface, the surface is preserved. So if you multiply the surface by, by a homothety, then you preserve the surface. That's another way of saying that the surface is a cone. So this density ratio is monotone, and it's constant if and only if you're on a cone. Okay, so the simplest type of cone, of course, would be, a, again, a hyperplane through the origin, in which case the, we already know the ratio is constant. Right? So it's like if you, like for instance, if, yeah, the ball of radius r in r2 has area pi r squared. So if I divide by the r squared, I always get pi independent of the r. Okay, so that's pretty much all I'm going to say about n-dimensional minimal surfaces. So now we're uh, minimal hypersurfaces. So now we're going to specialize to um, two-dimensional surfaces in R3. And that'll be pretty much for the, the remainder of, the, of this talk. So let me remind you what the classical minimal surfaces are. We'll, uh, so Matthias actually um, talked about a bunch, most of these before. And in fact, he used the same pictures, because these pictures are courtesy of Matthias. <laughs> so <laughs> they look slightly better here, but that's just to, you know, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> So, so, okay, so here's the catenoid. What is the catenoid? The catenoid is the unique, again, okay, so uh, a bunch of times I'm going to say unique. Uh, that will always be un understood to mean the unique non-flat, because in almost every case, the plane will also satisfy some of the things I'm talking about. Okay, so the, uh, the catenoid is a unique rotational uh, minimal surface. It was discovered in 1744 by Euler, uh, but he was just looking uh, uh, among surfaces of rotation. It wasn't, known to be, it wasn't shown to be minimal until 1776. Um, okay, so by minimal meaning a criti the real critical point for area, or having mean curvature zero. It's the only complete embedded uh, topological annulus. So here, we'll see a big theme is that if we, we wanna, uh, okay, we'd like to sort of classify minimal surfaces, um, the embedded minimal surfaces, and so you'll do that by on topology. So you'll say fix a topological type and you'll describe the minimal surfaces with that topology. So here, this is a minimal surface with two ends. So there are two ways of running off to infinity. You look at each of these things are, are continued out. Uh, and it has genus zero, meaning um, that if I fill in those ends, so I compactify them, then what I get is a sphere. So in this case, it's, it looks like a sphere with two points removed. So here it's, it's actually given as a set where x squared plus y squared is cosh squared z. So the fact that it's cosh squared, so which grows exponentially, means that the height over the xy plane grows only logarithmically. So in Matthias' talk, he scaled these catenoids down so that you could see them look very, uh, very much like a, a pair of planes connected by a neck. The fact that they scale down and look like planes corresponds to that the, the growth of the height, uh, the distance between these two ends is less than linear. So that forces it to scale away to nothing. In fact, here it's logarithmic, which is a lot less than linear. Okay, so that's the, uh, the, the simplest non-flat minimal surface. Okay, what's the next one? Oh, I should say also the catenoid is an example of a minimal surface with finite total curvature. Um, one way, uh, okay, uh, yeah, just say that. So finite total curvature uh, here, the next surface, the helicoid, 
So this was also discovered in 1776. So it's uh, a double spiral staircase where you take your pen and lift and rotate at constant speed. As you do, um, one tip traces out one of the spirals and the other tip traces out the other spiral. So here you see that shown by uh, the coloring in red and blue. So if you imagine that you were, uh, so the double spiral uh, staircase part is that if you were walking on a red spiral, you could be walking up while someone was walking down on the blue spiral, uh, they would pass each other and never see each other. Okay, and so this is also why I sometimes get lost in parking garages. I don't know about the rest of you. <laughs> if you think you're on floor three, it turns out there's like three, floor 3A three and 3B, depending on which spiral you're on. Uh, okay, that's the only application I know of uh, for some of my work, I think. But. <laughs> okay, so this is a complete, embedded, singly periodic, and simply connected. So this is given by a graph. If, if you were to think of this as, as being in polar coordinates, so this is, as a set, it's where the tangent of z is y over x. So in other words, this is like the graph of the function theta in polar coordinates. Okay, so in other words, see z is arctangent of y over x. So this is the graph of theta. It's actually the graph of theta and theta plus pi for the two corresponding things. This is an example of what we, uh, so we really should have invented one notation for it, one name for it, Invent, I know, we should have used one name for it and stuck to that. Instead, sometimes we call it a double spiral staircase and sometimes we call it a multi-value graph. Um, and Harold Rosenberg has suggest, had suggested at one point that would have been uh, we would have done ourselves a favor by calling it a multi-graph instead of a multi-value graph. It could have saved a lot of uh, letters. Okay, so this, it's the, the, the graph of theta. So now, what does that tell us? So think about the derivative of theta. The derivative, uh, okay, so if you look at, at theta, as you go all the way around a circle of radius r, theta goes up by 2 pi. So roughly speaking, uh, you know, it's, the derivative of theta is a, is a nice radial thing, so uh, if it goes up by 2 pi on distance r, uh, that means it's like 2 pi over r for the derivative, which means that it's getting very, very flat as you move out. What that corresponds to is if you took this helicoid and you squeezed it, you dilated it down, so that this, um, say this, instead of the spacing between the sheets being pi, make it pi over r, then the gradient's going to go down by a, a large factor. If you do this and let r go to infinity, it's becoming evenly distributed, and yet the gradient's going to zero, so it's becoming flat. So if you take a sequence of rescalings of these so that you, you uh, push the sheets all the way together, then away from the axis, where things are, are spiraling like crazy, away from the axis, the gradient goes to zero, and the spacing between sheets goes to zero. So this sequence converges, you know, in some sense, to a foliation by para flat parallel planes. And this, uh, this convergence is away from an axis. Along the axis, the rate of spiraling goes to infinity, so the curvature is going to infinity. So you would say that this sequence converges away from a singular set, which is equal to this line, to a foliation by parallel plane. Okay, so that's what we'd like to talk about with the helicoid. Uh, so continuing on the classical minimal surfaces, the next family is, is um, called the Riemann examples. Uh, these were discovered by Riemann ar around 1860. Um, so each of these is a complete embedded and singly periodic in genus zero. So here, each of these ends is asymptotic to a plane. All of these planes are parallel. If I wanted to compactify it, I'd have to add a point for each of these, these planes. If I was to you know, keep doing that, eventually it would become an infinite cylinder. Um, so it's genus zero. So there are no handles. So the single, uh, okay, so now this is actually part of uh, the previous examples. You could do rigid motions and homotheties to it. Otherwise, they were unique. This time, there's a non-trivial parameter. Okay, so I can think of these as having two parameters. One of them is the size of the neck. And the second is the angle. Uh, okay, so this periodic, there's this period vector on which it's translating. The angle that makes with the limiting plane is the second parameter. Okay, so I think of those as the two parameters in the, in the, in the family. Okay, now you can ask what happens uh, as I degenerate those parameters. Okay, so let's go back to the helicoid. In the helicoid case, the only parameter was the scale. We saw that as I degenerated that parameter by you know, collapsing it down, 
then it, it converged to foliations by parallel planes. Now I've got these two parameters, so could I, I could have different, sort of, uh, different sorts of degenerate limits. So suppose that I, um, okay, suppose that I fix the neck size, and now I allow the angle to go to zero. Okay, so now the necks are moving further and further apart, but the size of each neck remains constant. If I now focus on a, a region around one neck, that sequence converges to a, an ordinary catenoid. Okay, so the second thing I could do uh, is, so with this um, angle, is I could make it fix the neck size and now let the angle become vertical. As that happens, then it degenerates to uh, this parking garage structure that Matthias was talking about. It degenerates to a pair of oppositely oriented helicoids, one spiraling up and one spiraling down. Okay, so the fact that they're oppositely oriented, what that, uh, so I have these planar ends, uh, you know, the, that are asymptotic to a plane. So as I circle both, you know, as I circle, do a wide circle, I come back to where I started. So if I was just to circle, uh, you know, these two helicoids that are forming, if I just circled one of them, I would go down. If I circled the other, I come back up. So as you circle the pair, you get back where you started. Okay, so these are, are the, the, this family called the, the Riemann examples. Here's a, another picture where you start to see a little bit more of the, uh, this degeneration. You notice that, so that the planes are roughly parallel, uh, roughly uh, horizontal like that. And now the period vector has become almost vertical. And so if you look at that, uh, and maybe you're a little groggy or squint a little, you can almost see two helicoids forming, you know, one going down and one going up. Okay, so there's a, another. So so far, everything has been genus uh, zero. Here's an, uh, this is an example called the genus one helicoid. This is a piece of it, anyway. Uh, and the structure just continues as you go up. So this is uh, a surf so this surface has genus one. It has one end. So there's only one way. So if you, outside a compact set, it's connected, or if you like, there's only one way to go to infinity. Um, this and it, it's asymptotic to a helicoid. So this one was constructed as a limit of singly periodic genus one helicoids uh, by Matthias and Mike Wolf and David Hoffman in 2000, uh, well, before that, but appeared in 2009. Uh, so, and it was also, after, after that, it was constructed variationally by David Hoffman and, and, and Brian White. Okay, so this, again, it's complete embedded minimal surface, asymptotic to helicoid, has genus one and one end. So genus one and one end means that if you were to compactify the end, you fill, you know, fill in that puncture, then you'd actually have a torus. That's what that means. Okay, so now what am, uh, okay, so now let's, so those are, that's your zoo of minimal surfaces to keep in mind. So I'd like to talk a little bit about, uh, so these minimal surfaces, we want to think of them as critical points. So let's come back and talk a little bit about the index of the critical point. After we uh, get that taken care of, then we'll move on and talk a little bit about the classification of, of minimal surfaces. So, okay, so the second variation, just like we did with curves, um, you can ask, so it's a critical point, uh, you know the first, if you take a one parameter family, the first derivative of the volume is going to be zero, what's the second derivative? Of course, it depends on the direction that you move, so here I'm taking a, a, a variation, so sigma s is a one parameter family of minimal surfaces, it's a normal variation, you notice that I'm moving in the normal direction. I move, at, you know, then I have some function f that I multiply by, and then I, s is the parameter. When s is equal to zero, I get the surface itself. And now I differentiate, take a second derivative of volume with respect to this, and I, here's the second variation formula. You get the gradient of f squared minus mod a squared times f squared, so a here is the second fundamental form. Um, that grad f squared, you could, uh, here, f, assuming f has compact support here, you could uh, integrate off of it, so take one of the grads off of the f, and, and you end up with an f times Laplace f. So then you see this is this Jacobi operator. Laplacian plus mod a squared is this Jacobi operator, a second variation operator. Uh, that's the formula in R, you know, in Euclidean space. If you do it in a Ramanian manifold, there's a third term on the right-hand side, which is the Ricci curvature in the normal direction. So for instance, just like we saw there were no stable uh, geodesics in S2, this shows that there are no stable minimal surfaces in S3. Okay, this, uh, the sphere has positive Ricci curvature, so if you just take the function f 
equal 1 and stick that in there, the gradient goes away. The other two terms are negative. Okay, so there are no, uh, so again, if you, so this relates to Camillo's talk, if you were trying to find a minimal surface in S3 and you looked and you tried to minimize, say, in a, a, some class, it would be sort of uh, hopeless. Okay, there are no, uh, there are no stable ones, let alone minimizers. This just reminded you of the second variation formula. So the surface is said to be stable when the second variation is non-negative for every function f. This is equivalent to this operator, Laplacian plus mod a squared being non-negative. Again, where now I, we do this twisted sense of non-negative. Okay, so a, use, just a useful analytic criterion, uh, it's sigma is stable if and only if you can find a positive function uh, that satisfies the, in the kernel of the Jacobi operator. So Laplacian u is minus, minus mod a squared times u. Let me mention just one application of that fact. This is due to uh, uh, Doris Fisher Colbury and, and Rick Shane. So if you have, again, I've noticed that, recall that I've always been assuming there is a unit normal, so that, in other words, the, it's two sided. But suppose you were in a three manifold, and you could have the same thing now of a Ricci curvature uh, term that was in there. So then, if you have a two sided surface that's stable, it follows that all covers of it are also stable. Okay, so, and the idea there is that if it's stable, you get this positive solution. Now you look at any surface that, uh, that covers it. Satisfying this equation is a purely local property. So that solution U lifts to a solution in the kernel on the cover. So therefore, the cover is also stable. That's um, interesting in that it's also sharp, that the use of two-sided, because if you look at RP2 sitting inside RP3, that is stable, but it lists to S2 sitting in the S3, which is not stable. So you see that the, that assumption of, of having the unit normal is essential. Okay, so now what's one uh, consequence of this useful criterion? Well, this is the, the um, if you take any killing field, any ambient killing field, so that's the vector field that generates an isometry, and then look at the normal part of that, that is automatically going to be a Jacobi field. So that it'll be in the kernel of this operator. Now suppose you have a graph. So if you have a graph, you look at the normal vector field, the vertical vector field, you take the normal part of that. Because it's a graph, that's non-vanishing, so it's a positive solution in the kernel of this Jacobi operator. So therefore, all graphs are stable. Now, you'll notice that, that uh, you'll recall, I was talking about multi-value graphs a little while ago. Okay, so the helicoid, if I, once I remove the axis, is given as a, a union of two multi-value graphs. Over in, in polar coordinates. So again, being, um, okay, so satisfying this equation is just a local thing. So again, if I take that vertical vector field and take the normal part of it on this, and restrict it to this multi-value graph, it's in the kernel of this uh, Jacobi operator. So therefore, they are stable also. So the helicoid take away the axis is actually stable. In fact, each half of the helicoid, once you take away the axis, it turns out even to be uh, area minimizing. So you'll recall the picture that I showed you of this uh, soap film where you had part of a helicoid um, show, showing up actually as a soap bubble, bubble where you had this wire in the middle and then the, the wire going around. The reason it arises physically is because it is stable. It wouldn't arise physically if it was not, or it would be very unlikely to. Okay, so uh, now what, what's one of the, the big uses of, of uh, stable surfaces? To remind you, Rick Shane has a curvature estimate for stable minimal surfaces. So if you have a surface in R3, and this is, this is valid in, in any Ramanian 3-manifold, and then if you have a, a ball which is sta and it's stable in a ball, then on half the ball you get some uniform estimate for the curvature. The factors of R are just to make the, the statement scale invariant. Okay, so as a consequence of this in R3, if you allow R to go to infinity, you see that sigma is flat. So this, this gives a a new proof of the Bernstein theorem, or you know, this gave a new proof of the Bernstein theorem because we said that minimal graphs are stable. Since they're complete, you can let R go to infinity, and you see that mod A is identically zero on a minimal graph, so it's a plane, just to connect up. This, I should say one thing, um, this statement so, uh, is valid in up to dimension seven, although it's, it's one of these fence post things. I never want to say exactly. It's a seven plus or it's valid up to dimension seven plus or minus one, uh, and but only under the additional assumption that there's an area bound for sigma. 
So that's uh, results of Shane Simon Yao and then, and then Leon Simon. Shane Simon Yao did it up through dimension five and then uh, Leon uh, extended to a few higher dimensions. Uh, really interesting problem is a conjecture of Rick Shane, which in, suppose you have a hypersurface in R4 and it's stable, then do you get such a curvature bound even without assuming a bound for the volume, the three-dimensional volume, and that's not known. Okay, so those are some of the basic tools uh, for minimal surfaces and um, some of the classical examples. So let's move on to talk a little bit about classifying uh, minimal surfaces. So as I said, the classification goes roughly by topology. So by increasing complexity of topology, we'll, we'll list sort of what can happen. Okay, so Mike, you promised you would ask a question. The previous, yeah. The previous slide, uh, what is that? Oh, C is a fixed constant. C is a fixed constant, that's right. So the same as for any remaining manifold. Yeah, but then there's a constant depending on the manifold, say on the, the injectivity radius and curvatures, and it's only valid for a, a radius up to some level. Otherwise, you could scale it away and say that they were always flat in any Ramani manifold, which they're not. It's a local statement in a Ramani manifold. Okay, yeah, so at the beginning of the first talk, I, I basically begged for questions, then I, I repeated that. Now I'm going to do it again. Uh, Mike has told me that he would ask at least one question. So I'll. Okay, all right, that counts. Okay, so, uh, right, so these are, uh, so stability. Um, okay, so the classification. Okay, so let's start with the, the, uh, the first case, so the disks. So basically what I'm going to do over the next couple of slides is give a rapid overview of some of the classification results. So um, suppose you now have a minimal disk in, R in a ball in R3. So Toby and I showed that any time you have an embedded minimal disk in a ball in R3, there was only one of two things that could happen. The first is that there's a bound for the curvature, say relative to the scale of the ball, in which case it's locally graphical. The second possibility is that it actually looks like a piece of a helicoid. Okay, so meaning that um, you can find this, uh, it contains a large multi-value graph, uh, just like the, the helicoid does. Okay, so, right, it is a helicoid, yeah, there, yeah, okay. So, the, and, and the way you can tell whether or not it's, a, it, it's part of a graph or uh, part of a helicoid is depending on the, how large the curvature is. So when I say how large the curvature is, I mean how large the curvature is relative to the size of the piece that you're looking at. Okay, so how, uh, right, so that's the result. So let's just talk a little bit. There are some pictures, uh, which didn't turn out all that well. Uh, okay, so again, as I said, there are three different ways to, to talk about pieces of a helicoid. You can either say it's a piece of a helicoid, you can say it's a double spiral staircase, or you can say it's a, say it's a pair of, of multi-value graphs. If you want to say double spiral staircase, then you can find very old uh, pictures of double spiral staircases. These are a couple um, due to da Vinci. Uh, one is a, a, one of his drawings where he was designing a double spiral staircase. Another is a model of a double spiral staircase that he actually uh, did design. It's, of course, completely irrelevant. <laughs> okay, so... Now, there are three main steps. So this, this first result that I showed, which showed that if you have an, an embedded minimal disk in R3, either it's very flat and looks like part of a, of a, a, it looks like a graph, or the curvature is large and then it, lo it, it uh, looks like part of a helicoid. So how do you do that? Well, if the curvature is small, so the curvature is the derivative of the unit normal. So if the curvature is small, the unit normal doesn't change much, and it's a graph. So that's all you need to say. The whole point is to understand when the curvature is not small. So what happens when the curvature is large? And so this is sort of done in three steps. The first thing is it, we show that if the curvature is large, then you can look somewhere on the scale of the curvature. Okay, so roughly speaking, uh, this would, uh, so these guys it's, uh, in general are non-compact, so it's a little bit more complicated, but this should remind you a little bit of, say, like a sachs uhlenbeck approach. So if, uh, just to remind you there, so when sachs uhlenbeck were, were looking at these, uh, they tried to, to, to produce harmonic S2s. They uh, looked at a sequence, uh, so you, they were able to produce uh, solutions of this perturbed equation where the functional was made, was no, above the critical threshold, and they took this sequence 
of S2s, and they show that if, if the gradient stayed bounded, um, then it must converge uh, smoothly to an actual harmonic S2. If the gradient was going to infinity, then you could rescale, make the gradient 1, and this rescaled sequence where the gradient was now bounded by 1 everywhere and, and, and equal to 1 at the maximum, you could do the rescaling just by dilations, that would have to converge to an actual S2. So again, it's sort of a rescaling idea here, where if the curvature is becoming very large, suppose it was actually achieved its maximum. Then you would look at that point where it was achieving its maximum, scale the curvature so that it was equal to 1 at that point. You've now taken a small piece and made it large. So now the curvature is now bounded by 1 everywhere, equal to 1 at this point. And now you would analyze that sequence, and you would show that that, that sequence actually had to be well approximated by a piece of a helicoid. That's much simpler because you get to assume a bound on a curvature and you're only working on a given scale. Okay, so that's a much simpler result. So that's the starting point. You find a small piece of a helicoid, small meaning on the scale of the maximum of the curvature. Okay, so we've got that little bit of a multivalue graph structure forming. Now what we want to do is we want to grow that out. That's right, that's right. It's a small, it's a small piece of the manifold which looks like a big piece of a helicoid scaled down. That's, that's, a. that's A. That's A in this picture, right? That's right. Yeah, can you tell the difference between Matthias's figures and mine? <laughs> okay, so that's the first step. The, uh, in case you wanted, this is one of mine. So the second step is to, to grow this structure out. Now, this multivalue graph, again, so what does this look like? In polar coordinates, I have this little piece. It's a graph of a function. It's not quite a theta because it's not actually a helicoid, but it's just a pertur perturbation of that. It looks very much like a helicoid. It winds around like this. And now I want to take that structure and I want to grow it out by making it go all the way out to the boundary on the side. That's the next step. So this thing, say, say I've got n rotations, n's a big number, 100 rotations of the helicoid. I'd like at least 50 rotations of the helicoid to extend all the way out. That's the next step. So what is it that makes that work? The key thing there, and that this, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's rather complicated, but the key, the key, really what is driving things is that if you look at this multivalue graph, now look at, um, okay, so that when it comes back and almost closes up, look at the, the distance, the difference, what we call the separation. So in other words, I look at u, so u is a function of theta. I look at u of theta plus 2 pi minus u of theta. Okay, so these are two solutions of the minimal graph equation. I look at the difference between them. Because they're very close together, that difference is almost a solution of the Jacobi equation. It's almost a solution of the linearized equation. Okay, so now that solution of the linearized equation um, is, is positive, and that's where embeddedness comes in again. So they have this positive solution of the linearized equation, and now this solution is defined on a whole bunch of rotations over, you know, so this uh, multi, this high cover of, of the punctured disk. A hundred times cover of the punctured disk. Well, what that is forcing, there's, there's a Louisville property here. If you had a positive harmonic function that was defined on the entire punctured plane, it has to be constant. Here we have something which is conformally close to the entire punctured plane. It's defined down to a small scale and out to a large multiple of that and it's defined a whole bunch of times around. Okay, so this is conformally close to a large cover of the punctured plane. So I, we can't anymore say that it's constant. The separation isn't constant, but it's very close to constant, meaning that, uh, so this is like the gradient estimate instead of the Harnack inequality. Instead of being constant, the gra grad of u over u is bounded by a small constant times r. So what this means is that this separation grows, as I move out, can grow only to a small power. The rate of growth is r to a small constant. Okay, so this means that these, these sheets that start off very close together, what you would worry about, what you would expect, is they might go apart, grow apart linearly. Instead, they can only grow to r to a, a small power, which, which means that they look as though they're even closer and closer together. This fundamentally is what keeps these things tightly coiled and allows you to continue the sheets out. As long as you can continue them out, they stay stable. Again, I've got my positive solution of, a linear, of this uh, Jacobi equation, which gives me some control, some, you know, because of the Shane's estimate. 
I get some control on this. But they've forced to stay close, which allows me to keep continuing. And in fact, the fact that they grow less than linearly gives me an improvement so I don't lose when I iterate. In fact, I gain. That's inherently what's going on in, in the second step, or the step B. OK, now in the, th the third step, step C, what we do is we want to grow this multi-value graph structure north. So we'd like them to keep spiraling and to fill up the whole space. OK, so that that's, uh, again gets more complicated. Um, so maybe I won't say too much about that, but just not, uh, you get sort of maybe get the idea. This is what's involved. So now you've got this spiraling. We extend it out, you know, we, we get it, show that it exists on a small scale. We extend it out horizontally. And then we come back and extend it out vertically. And again, there, now there are two things that are driving it. The main thing, okay, so I'll show you a, a curvature estimate in a minute. We call the one-sided curvature estimate. This is going to give you that it spirals out in some cones but it doesn't tell you that it can't stop, it can't accumulate. So there's going to be something else, some properness that comes in. Um, but maybe I'll leave that as a teaser. OK, so I just want to mention a, a, an example. OK, so here, and again, this is my figure, not Matthias's. Uh, so here's an example of, of some helicoid where what, what you're going to do, so you, take, you want it to be a multi-value graph like the helicoid, but now you're going to take your pen and lift and rotate. But instead of doing it at a constant speed, as you, let's say maybe we'll low, lower and rotate, as you approach the origin, you're going to rotate it faster and faster. Okay, so it's, it's more and more twisted as you approach the origin. An example, because of a theorem that Toby and I proved, you cannot have an example like this that lives in all of R3. But you can have an example that lives in a unit ball. So what we did is we actually wrote down Weierstrass data to, form, to, to, to you know, give this example, then we proved it was embedded. And so here's an example. So now what is, and, and in fact, the, the speed at which it rotates goes to infinity. It's a whole sequence of examples. So this gives a funny limit. The limit that you get of this is, is this twisted thing, which is sort of slowly twisted, faster and faster twisted. And then if you, uh, it, can, it always contains the axis. But if you're away from the axis, and you just go around circling the axis like this, you would go around infinitely many times, and you would never reach the, pl the horizontal plane through the origin. You just spiral infinitely into that. Then there's the mirror picture underneath. So as a limit, again, before I talked about these rescale helicoids converging to a foliation by R3, as a limit, this would converge to what's called a lamination. And there would be three leaves of this lamination. One leaf is this limiting leaf, which is the horizontal plane through the origin. And then there are leaves above and below, which spiral infinitely and reach the origin in finite distance because they all contain the axis. So the distance to the origin is finite if you go along the axis. If you were to go circle like this, you would go infinitely long and never reach the axis. So clearly, the origin is a singularity for this lamination. This is an example of a singular limit lamination. OK, so now there are other examples along this illustrating other local behavior. So uh, Matthias and Bill Meeks gave an, have an example of which, which uh, is like a bent helicoid. So in that case, um, so with the helicoid, you have this axis, and it spirals around it at even speed. The example I was just illustrating before, you, you still have the axis, but you spiral at this varying speed. In the bent helicoid case, what you do is you, the axis is bent. You still have roughly constant speed spiraling around the axis. Uh, but now the shape is bent. And now there's a singularity that's sort of in the middle. This, is, again, is, is not globally defined. Uh, Brian White and David Hoffman uh, have given the, the sort of, if you look at this case of just having an axis and ask what kind, what kind of uh, structures can you have along the axis. So in this case, what I mean is, um, so suppose I was to intersect with a transversal, what would I see? Uh, in the, the example I wrote down, I see these isolated points then accumulating into a point through the origin, infinitely many points there, and then the mirror picture underneath. So you ask what kind of sets can show up in that transversal. Uh, then uh, Brian and David showed that you can actually get any, an arbitrarily cl arbitrary closed set. So take that one-dimensional uh, line segment there, specify your, fa your favorite arbitrary closed set. You can find a sequence which converges to, you know, to, to a limit that has this as, it, as the, its intersection. Uh, Steve uh, Claney uh, gave a different proof of this using a, um, 
uh, virus stress representation where Brian and David used a variational construction. Uh, Maria Kalle and Darren Lee uh, gave an example along the lines of, of the Hoffman White example, but uh, in, in, in Romanian manifolds. They're flat. They're flat. You would, you would think that any, if given any minimal graph, then you would hope that you could take that corresponding foliation that arrives just by translating it. You might hope you'd be able to get something like that. There's no reason that I know of to assume that you always get planes. Okay. But, but those are the only examples that are known. So what do you mean by singular? Mm. Right. Yeah, that's right. So each point where the curvature goes to infinity will have a smooth leaf through it. But the places, right, right, these accumulating things are all singular. And they should again be like rough, qualitatively they look like these helico like helicoids. But they don't have to necessarily be flat, as flat as a helicoid. Okay, so, so that's um, the case of, of what's, what's known in the case of disks. Let's talk about genus zero. So in this case, again, the example to keep in mind is, is the Riemann example. So the Riemann example looks like a bunch of parallel planes connected by a periodic uh, collection of necks. So the way to think about, to understand this example is to de you would like to decompose it into pieces that you understand well. The right kind of pieces are these pairs of pants. Okay, so each plane has two necks that attach to it, one that goes up and one that goes down. If you cut along these two necks, which is supposed to have here, uh, then what you get is some, a topological thing called a pair of pants, right? So it's a, a disc with two sub-discs removed. The main disc is you know, the belt and then the two holes for your legs, the two trousers. Uh, these, one of, the, of course, you, know, you think of it, one is up inside out, right? So here's a pair of pants. And so what we show in this case is that you can decompose these surfaces into, into these sort of pieces. Um, and so then there's corresponding uh, statements for limits of them. OK, so I, was, I mentioned before something called a, a one-sided curvature estimate. So this is an estimate for, for uh, minimal disks, embedded minimal disks. So basically, here's the, the situation. Um, you have a hyperplane. You have a minimal, an embedded minimal disk which lives above the hyperplane, on one side of the hyperplane, and yet it comes close to the origin. What we show is if that happens, then that embedded minimal disk has to be basically graphical. It has to be nice and flat and graphical over the hyperplane. So this clearly, embed, being a disk is necessary because if you imagine now a rescale catenoid, we said the catenoid rescales to a plane. So you could rescale it till it's very, very flat, and you could place it as close as you want on one side of a plane. And yet the curvature is arbitrarily large at these points. Okay, so the catenoid does not satisfy this estimate. So this one-sided curvature estimate is valid only for disks. And in fact, only for embedded disks. Right? The catenoid you could think of as an immersed disk, just by passing to its universal cover. Okay, so um, basically what's the, the idea behind this? The idea behind this is that if the curvature, okay, so if it's not a graph, the curvature must be very, very large. Okay, because again, if there was any, control, any bound for the curvature at all, the fact that it comes close to the plane and lies on one side of it, the Harnack inequality would tell you it had to stay graphical for a long stretch. If you had any a priori bound on the curvature at all, then if it was close enough to the plane, it would be graphical. Okay, so because it would be a positive solution, the harmonic function, the gradient estimate would say that grad of that was, was, was bounded and you'd be in business because if grad of that is bounded, it's small, it's a graph. Okay, so, so if it's not, uh, all right, so if, if, if the curvature isn't really small, in fact, it's huge. And so we already said that if the curvature gets huge, then you get this multi-value, this little multi-value graph is born. Once this little multi-value graph is born, then again, we, we said we can extend it out to the boundary. So we have this multi-value graph. That if, so again, I'm talking about how you would prove this by talking about suppose it wasn't true, then what would happen? 
If it wasn't true, this little multi-value graph would form in the middle and start spiraling. So there, so now what we do is we show that as you move, as it, um, okay, so of course it can't spiral along an axis because that axis would then force it to go below the plane. So the only way this could happen is if it was spiraling along this tilted axis that ran off to the boundary and somehow snuck out here. What we do is we show that there is some definite slope. Once this spiral forms, it has to go down by some definite amount as it moves sideways. So this definite slope down is what does it. It, it allows you to say that it, it's going to have to go below the plane if, once it forms. And so then that, that's the contradiction. Okay, so now you might ask, why is it, what is it that's forcing it to, to have this slope? Okay, so there are several things. The first thing is that as this multi-value graph uh, spirals, you know it can't stop spiraling. It's got to, it's, so it must really keep going. Each time that you get, um, okay, so now if you look at these places where, where it's sort of the spirals are born, then you show that these actually eat up some definite amount of space. And now what you have to worry about is them moving off to the side. So now it just gets down to a delicate argument. You just count how much space, how much vertical space does each one eat up versus how far can it move horizontally. And you show that there's a definite slope. It's small, but it's positive, And this forces it to cut through. Okay, there's, a, there's another effect which is kind of uh, working here is that as the, as the sheets move off to the side, they could be going up very slightly. But again, this sublinear growth thing comes in again. It tells us that the rate at which they go up is very, very small. So it, it doesn't matter relative to this definite slope because it's a less than linear effect. Anyway, obviously that's not a proof. That's a few of the ideas behind it. Okay, so uh, now minimal surfaces. Again, overview, let's talk about some of the uniqueness results for minimal surfaces. So the results that I was just talking about are all, up till now, we're all local results, except for the Bernstein theorem. These results all apply to parts of minimal surfaces. You can ask global questions, like suppose you have a complete minimal surface with a list of few properties. All of them will be complete, minimal, and properly embedded. Properly embedded uh, means that if I intersect with a compact set what I see in, of Euclidean space, what I see is compact. Okay, so something that spirals infinitely in a compact set is not proper. So assume that I have these properties. Uh, okay, so the first unique, well, actually, I guess one of the oldest unique results, I, I think 1842, Catalan showed that uh, the helicoid was the unique ruled minimal surface. Again, non-flat ruled minimal surface. So in 1983, Rick Shane showed that the catenoid is the unique sigma with finite total curvature in two ends. So, uh, that argument actually was by a, one of these Alexandrov reflection arguments. So he used, just like, so just like Alexandrov showed that if you had an embedded closed, minimal sur a closed surface of constant mean curvature, that it had to be a, a sphere. The way he did that is he took a plane and reflected the surface, showed that it ended up having to be invariant about reflections, but then reflections about planes in all directions, so it had to be a sphere. So what Rick did is he used a non-compact version of that argument, where he showed that this if you had this minimal surface from the finite total curvature, you know it's asymptotic to a catenoid. And then you, you end up getting the reflection invariant, so it ends up having to be rotationally symmetric. The only rotationally symmetric ones are the catenoid. Okay, so that's a snapshot of, of, of just a few of the ideas in that. The next result, give, the next uniqueness of the catenoid is a result of Lopez and Ross from 1991. Uh, they showed that the catenoid is the unique uh, sigma with finite total curvature and genus zero. So in other words, the catenoid uh, is a sphere with two points removed, diffeomorphically. If you take a sphere and remove three points, there is no minimal surface that's in complete embedded and looks like that. That's the result. That's what Lopez, th those are the sort of things that Lopez and Ross are ruling out. A sphere with n points removed where n is greater than two. Okay, the next result is a 1997 Pascal Collin. Uh, and so he showed here, in fact, he showed more, but he showed the catenoid is the unique sigma with finite topology and two ends. Okay, notice the difference is I'm not saying finite total curvature now, I'm just saying finite topology. What Pascal showed is that if you have finite topology and at least two ends, then you have finite total curvature. There's a funny phenomenon here. Uh, it's good to have at least two ends. It's bad to have one end. The helicoid has one end. The helicoid has the simplest topological type, but it's one, it was one of the most difficult minimal surfaces to understand, beca precisely because there was only one end, 
this allowed it to have infinite total curvature. The ones with at least two ends, then you can use barrier methods to put a, basically you put a plane, an asymptotic plane between the two ends, and that forces each of the ends to lie in a half space. And that gives you a huge amount of extra structure. Okay, so the next result, oh, so I should say in, in 2001, Toby and I uh, gave a different proof of, of Pascal's theorem uh, using the one-sided curvature estimate. Um, basically there, again, uh, when you have at least two ends, you can put this barrier, stable barrier in between. So it's roughly like uh, thinking of you have something that lies above, say, above a plane. Now this end, it's easy to see as you go out, the end must come close to the plane. So now where it comes close to the plane, if you look in a ball there, it's a disk. It lies on one side of the plane. So from what, what we know, that means that it's actually a nice a piece of a graph. It's very close to the plane, so it's a very flat graph. I can now continue that. I circle you know, this large radius around the cylinder. I come back. It's still a flat graph. It can't, it's either above or below where it was before. Suppose it's below. Once that happens, that means I can, you know, or it closes up. If it closes up, then, then we're done. If it comes back below, then I can keep doing this, and it must, would have to spiral forever. And so that's a contradiction. That's roughly how that argument goes. OK, uh, you'll notice that here I always assume properness for these results. All of these results are true without assuming properness. And so that's a result, uh, as a consequence, in, uh, Toby and I proved that as long as you have finite topology you must be, and you're embedded in minimal, you must be proper. So properness, all of these uniqueness theorems and properness was one of the hypotheses, but that turns out to be unnecessary. Okay, so next um, uniqueness results. So let's talk about the helicoid. Um, so Meeks and Rosenberg showed that the, the helicoid is the unique, non-flat, complete embedded minimal disk properly embedded minimal disk. And so that, um, so there Toby and I had shown that basically it looks like a, a, uh, a helicoid, but the question of actually now to show that it actually is one. So uh, what they did there is first they showed that with this spiraling structure, that it was this monotone spiraling, it was constantly going up. And so they used this to show that in fact the, the uh, this uh, grad X3 never vanished. So that was uh, sort of like a, almost like a Rado type theorem argument. From this, they were able to show that, that uh, and, and, and actually another argument which I think is uh, better understood now by uh, Jacob Bernstein and Christine Breiner, or uh, a better, anyway, I don't know, better understood, but I prefer their argument. They showed that in fact this, this infinite total curvature surface had to be conformal to C. So you might worry that it was conformal to the hyperbolic disk instead, but it, they show it's conformal to C. And now it's a question of analyzing virus stress data and showing that, in fact, it's, it's the virus stress data of the helicoid. Okay, so uh, Jacob Bernstein and Christine Breiner showed that, uh, in fact, if you have any non-flat finite genus surface with one end, then that must be asymptotic to a helicoid. So Meeks and Rosenberg sketched an approach to that. Uh, finally, the, the last is, is the Riemann example. So recently, Meeks and Perez and Ross have shown that the Riemann examples are the unique sigmas with, with genus zero and infinitely many ends. So here, uh, so it follows from what, uh, what Toby and I did that, that in fact these guys are conformal uh, to a cylinder, a cylinder with infinitely many punctures. And again, now in this case, then one wants to understand, so the argument of Meeks, Perez, and Ross, that then they, they want to show that in fact, uh, they use the space of Jacobi fields, is now finite, about, say bounded Jacobi fields is finite dimensional. Uh, that's a result that Toby and I did jointly with, with Camilo here. And then, um, then they have a very clever argument uh, which, uh, to, to show, uh, looking at sh uh, Schiffman functions, which show that in fact, uh, they actually, the, uh, it must be one of the Riemann examples. So that's sort of complicated. OK, so last, the Kalabi Yao. OK, so in 1965, uh, Kalabi uh, made two conjectures about minimal surfaces. The first is that if you have a complete minimal surface, so complete in the sense of every geodesic goes to infinity, every geodesic is infinitely extendable, that it must be unbounded. So for instance, and, and uh, so in other words, it can't lie, say, in a fixed ball in R3. 
And the second is that if you have, uh, if you have a complete minimal surface, it must have an unbounded projection in every line. In other words, it can't lie in a slab unless it is the plane. Okay, so immersed versions of these were false. So there are immersed minimal surfaces giving counterexamples to both. The first were constructed by uh, Jorge and Xavier in 1980 uh, by using a Weierstrass representation. And Nadi Rashvili in, in 1996 used a Weierstrass representation to actually find one violating one. So it was actually inside a, a bounded set. Uh, Toby and I proved that if it's embedded with finite topology, then it's automatically proper. And so in particular, both of these conjectures hold in the embedded setting. Okay, that's probably where I should stop. Thank you. Uh, actually, Jacob and Christine were investigating the limits of, of uh, on what sort of how how the scale changes. What would you say, Jacob? Uh, inconclusive. inconclusive. I mean, there's a Harnack inequality that controls the change from one scale to the next. So it's going to be at worst exponential. Uh, but better than, other than that, I don't know. Also, did you, I mean, in, I didn't quite catch the motivation, I think, for set A in the, uh, in the, in the Anil Dose 4 paper description. OK. Right. OK, so why, why, why does it look like a helicoid at small scale? So, once, so now on the small scale, you can now assume the curvature is bounded by 1, and you can assume that the area is huge. So we, we know that uh, okay, so the area is huge. So you have this, all this area packed into a bounded set um, in R3, and yet with bounded curvature. So what happens is that means the surface, there must be many places where the surface, are com surface comes close to itself. Huge area in a, in a bounded region. So the surface comes close to itself, has bounded curvature. Once it comes close to itself and has this curvature bound, it can be written as a graph over itself there. By embeddedness, it's a graph of a positive function. So by the Harnack inequality, it takes a while for it to pull itself apart. So now you can grow out these regions. These regions are actually stable. Because again, the graph of a pos you, know, it's, you have this positive solution to the linearized equation. Okay? So, Basically, it's this, so now you get these huge stable regions, which can be continued as long as, you, you know, like this all around. And the only way that, basically, the only way that can happen is with this spiraling structure. 